let's so we do just kind of an overview of like the favorite of the fool experience and how it's worked out for you and and then, then we'll see maybe what we want to focus on for for there but you know what's it has been good for you <laughs> Yeah, so the favorite in the pool concept has been extremely valuable in terms of um, managing my time and not wasting my time. It's also um, led to a lot less frustration in terms of having a great meeting with someone and wondering why I didn't get hired because the signs and signals are all there if you just look for them. And so for me, you know, I start putting it into practice where I'm looking for those signs and signals of am I the favorite or am I the fool? Did they call me? Do they know who I am? Do they know anything about, you know, my track record, um, you know, my practice here in, especially in Santa Monica? Um, do they have uh, urgency and realistic expectations? And what is their process? How, are they interviewing 20 people? Like I talked to someone who interviewed eight agents wow. they want me to come over and see the property I, I i and really pushed me to come see the property and give them a price and i politely declined repeatedly yeah yeah and so it's 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 really uh, informative about where i want to spend my time and what i want to let go and and to not get so I, i'm not wondering anymore what happened i think what what's shifted for me is sometimes uh i get irritated because people are really pumping me for free information and, um, and they get upset. Right. And you won't provide it. And so learning how to, and I'm still learning how to delicately decline the free consulting um, and leave them, you know, like in their own sort of agency around making their own decisions for themselves and let them do it and not try to convince otherwise. So that's been an interesting exercise. But for me, yeah. the, you know, did they call me? Do they know who I am? And, you know, are they ready to talk with me in terms of, we, our first meeting is a Zoom meeting. So somebody calls, they email me, they're like, oh, we were thinking about selling. I like to have a five or 10 minute conversation with them and then set up a Zoom meeting. I want to know what the lay of the land is, at least briefly. And if they're, you know, reasonable people that seem safe to have a Zoom meeting with, have a, have a short conversation, set up a Zoom meeting. And the Zoom meeting is just a meet and greet. Right. I want to find out, I want to get to know them. I want them to get to know me. And I'm really trying to keep those Zoom meetings to like 30 or 40 minutes. Um, when I'm the favorite, they're 30 minutes. When I'm the fool, they're an hour, 90 minutes longer. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Complete primer and education on the market, history of sales in Santa Monica, you know, all the what if scenarios and blah, blah, blah. When I'm the favorite, they just want to sign the contract and move on to the next, the next stage. And so we do right. those, we do those Zoom calls and that Zoom call tells you everything you need to know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so I've, I don't go to, I don't visit the properties anymore. You know, it used to work for in real estate that you get a call. I want to sell my house. You just, you spend two hours getting ready with all your presentation materials, doing a market analysis, getting all your marketing pieces together as, as, as examples, putting together this huge 11 by 17 fancy presentation, loading all of that up with my laptop in the car, driving to their property with people I've never met before going through the whole dog and pony show and then find out that their you know, nephew who's never sold a house was just the benefit of all of this information and that's who lists it. And so now <laughs> I'm really trying to avoid that scenario. You know, I wanna find people who wanna work with me and the, the rest of it doesn't, you know, I don't have to go through that preparation. I don't have to go through that waste of like a two hour appointment at the house um, where I don't even have a shot. So I really want to find that out in the Zoom call. Do we have a shot? Where are we on the spectrum? Am I going to put some more time into this? And I can tell you that I'm signing contracts before ever seeing the house on a regular basis at this point. Wow. And that has been the goal. I sign the contract. We put in a we pick a price that's reasonable based on the information that we know. 
we sign the contract, then I go see the house. If we need to refine the price after that, which we sometimes do, we can change the price with just a signature. And at that, you know, when I go see the house, that's when I, I give them the list of like their to do's on their home preparation to get it in sale ready condition. But I don't want to do that's the work product, right? What is your house worth? What's it going to take to get it is my value. Right. So that my clients are now benefiting from that, not just everyone who gives me a call. Well, they're actually saving time also, aren't they? Yeah, but they're, I think they're not getting what they want. I think what they really want is another opinion or they want additional information to either make sure that the guy or the woman that they've decided upon knows enough, or if they don't, they can supplement that knowledge with what I'm bringing to the table without free hiring. Consulting. Yes, free consulting. I think that's a lot of what it is. They want another opinion. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so uh, mindset now, and I don't know if you can contrast it before you started implementing, you know, mindset, you know, paying your dues, how happy you were in, in any sense of the differences. So I think the mindset before we always talk about this with Steve is like chasing, right? It's like, yeah. what do I have to do um, to get this listing? And I don't have that mindset any longer. My mindset is, is this a fit? And that's a very different place to come from, right? I, you know, when I started really charging my full fee, I'm not going to negotiate it anyway. So I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to doormat myself <laughs> to get the listing. And so because I don't use that approach anymore, implementing the sort of understanding of this favorite or the fool mentality has to happen because otherwise I'm just going to be at loggerheads over and over with people who were never going to hire me in the first place. Right. And so if I'm really going to charge my full fee and I'm really looking for clients who really want to work with me in a collaborative, normal sort of relationship, you know, I, there's a lot of people out there that want to fight. I don't want that. I, I want to be on the same side as my clients. I do not want to be in um, a confrontational relationship with my clients. So I'm looking for people who are collaborative, who are on the same side as me, who trust me, who know my reputation and who are willing to pay for all of that. And so that's a very different mindset than what do I have to do to get this listing? And yeah, so you're not doormatting yourself. That's got, that doesn't feel, make you feel good about yourself, does it? Last year, I went on an appointment with, uh, and I treat them all as like, it's who knows, right? I, I don't treat them all as what do I have to do? I treat them all as let's see what happens. Right. And so I went on this appointment last year, guys, a developer, and he had been the original, converted this original building from apartments to condos a thousand years ago. And the last tenant was moving out in Santa Monica. Certain conversions, the existing tenants got a lifetime lease. So this, this tenant is finally moving and he's going to um, remodel and put this unit on the market. So I had a lot of assumptions about this guy, right? Um, developer, lots of mover and shaker, owns a lot of income properties. And I had uh, some preconceived notions about his willingness to actually pay me my fee. And I did the appointment in the construction site and I didn't give him the price. I just went to meet him and see the property. And um, during that appointment, I said, you know, I've got some, I've got some things that we need to talk about that could be deal breakers for you. And maybe even bad news, because this is going really well. And I might, you know, I might throw a wrench in the works with this information. So I'd like to, you know, put that on the table, may I? And he said, of course. And I said, well, you know, there's certain things that, that, um, you know, there's my top 10 list of reasons of why you're not going to want to work with me. And there's actually only four, but um, that usually gets a laugh. And he said, 10. I said, no, there's only probably four. And I said, well, you know, first <laughs> and foremost, you know, I'm a full service, full fee agent. I charge 6%. And of that 6%, I take three and a half. And I said, I'm going to encourage you to price the property at a price that will cause it to sell and sell quickly. 
And that might very well be at a price that's less than um, what you'd like to see. And I'm gonna encourage you to invest in preparing it for sale. And, nice. you're gonna, and you're gonna need to stage the home. And the last thing is that I don't work 24 seven and you'll never need me and not get me, but you're not gonna need me at 10 o'clock at night. And my phone goes off at six. And so he stood there and he stepped back from me. By the way, it was like a million degrees in there. It was the middle of the summer. It's a hot, dusty construction zone. I'm in a dress trying to keep my composure in a mask right. during COVID. Um, incredibly uncomfortable. And this was the first time that I had delivered this sort of list. And he took a step back and he went, wow, that's a lot of conditions. We're just, we just got, we just met. And I said, you know, I prefer, and I laughed and I said, I actually prefer to think of them as standards. And he took a beat and he said, why don't you split the commission equally 3% to buyer and seller's agent? And in that moment, I knew I was hired because he only was asking a question about you know, I take three and a half and pay the buyer's agent two and a half. He was only asking about why it wasn't split equally. And I knew in that moment he would hire me. And he did and paid, did everything I asked and paid me 6%. And so in that moment, and I shared this with Steve, who's smiling, I had this sort of upwelling of self-worth <laughs> and confidence, right? And just feeling really powerful and really on top of my game because it was okay if he didn't hire me but I had to tell myself right these are my standards I charge six percent I take three and a half the buyer's agent gets two and a half I'm going to encourage the seller you the seller's going to have to price it at a price that will in, in, cause it to sell and sell quickly they're going to have to invest money in preparing it for sale and I don't work 24 seven. I shut my phone off at six and I don't work Saturdays, which people are like, oh, you're a real turn. You don't work Saturdays. I'm like, well, which day would it would work? None of them. So I picked the one that works for me. And I can't tell you that when I start bringing that to the conversation around the, am I the favorite or the fool? Man, that weeds them out really quickly, right? Yeah, it yeah. weeds them out. The things that will weed them out are those sort of standards and also my process that I'm not coming over to your house and giving you the whole marketing plan, the pricing strategy, the preparation items, unless I'm your realtor and we sign a contract before that happens. And I'll, I'll tell you, I've had, so that was a great example. Another example recently, I, I was referred to a couple selling their Santa Monica townhouse by someone that I had a good relationship with. He ended up not selling his property, but you know we have a good connection. He referred me as neighbors. They were pretty far down the path with another realtor. And so again, I made these assumptions that, well, I don't know if I have much of a shot here, but I'll meet with them. Same thing. Short conversation on the phone, set up the Zoom call. And in the Zoom call, I learned that although they were far down the path with another agent, they weren't really enthused. They didn't feel like they were in the right hands, that they were getting the best advice, and they didn't really feel that she knew this particular market, which I do, this is my, my market. And during that conversation, which was 30 minutes long, we went through what I thought you know, would be a ballpark price. I can't give them anything definite because I haven't seen it. Um, and I told them that you know, here's what we generally do for preparation. I showed them some befores and afters of uh, some of our listings. I went through my you know, standards, my pricing and all of that. And I said, so if you wanna move forward, you have to make a decision if you wanna to work together and then we can set up the next appointment for me to come to your house. And it was husband and wife and they looked at each other. And I think he said to her, any concerns? And she said, no. And he looks back to me and says, you're hired, send us the contract. So that, so that's magic. So that brief, conversation is where it's just all of it's working. They got referred to me by a trusted advisor. They did some homework on me and they were familiar because they've been receiving my um, postcards for you know forever. They were not happy with the person they were with 
And that was my job to find out, right? My job was to find out, is there room here? And by finding out, like, it, it's easy to figure out if you're the favorite. They do what you ask. They don't balk at the appointment times. If you want to have a phone call and not an email, they'll make time for the phone call. They have the Zoom call with you. They understand exactly what's happening immediately. And then you get hired immediately. And then contrast that with like yesterday, we, uh, we were referred, one of my buyer's agents got a call from one of the people we sold a house to recently. Oh, hey, my friend's selling her condo caller. So Gabby and I got on the phone. Um, but I had suggested a phone call, I actually called and she emailed and said, I told you to email me. And right then, right then I knew, I told you to email me. Mm -hmm. I knew that I was not the favorite. And yet, you know, I'm gonna explore this and see if we can at least have an appointment. She agreed to a Zoom call. And just immediately in the Zoom call, it was very clear that we were not the favorite. She didn't know anything about us. I sell more condos in Santa Monica than anyone. She had no idea who I was. And she's selling a Santa Monica townhouse. So she'd done no, no homework. So she was right. referred by a trusted advisor, but I think now truly late in the game. And so we went through this conversation and told her a little bit how I work. And she like said, I don't think that's going to work for me. And I said, well, you know, that I would want to have, um, I said, this, this is to see if we're comfortable working together. Mm -hmm. And if we are, then we take the next step. And um, if you feel confident in all of that. And, and I said, because the way I work is, you know, you'll be delivered the, the consultation of how to price your home and that strategy and how to prepare it once we've decided to work together and sign a contract. And that, she goes, I don't know that that's gonna work for me. And I said, okay, so what has your process been so far? And she said, well, I've talked to, you know, several agents and I said, okay. So if you had to make a decision today, um, you know, without us being there, right? Just whatever agents that you've met so far before you met me, you had to pick one of them. Is there someone that you would choose? Is, a, is there a favorite? And she said, well, I don't know if he's my favorite, but I feel very comfortable with him. And I said, oh, great. So who's that? And she told me. And then it started to, then all of the stuff came out about how, how she has a favorite and it is not me. Mm -hmm. And so I just asked a few questions like, you know, what's important about this? What's important about that, et cetera. And basically the upshot was she made a comment that, um, you know, he's young and hungry. And so I hear discount, <laughs> he's right. young and hungry. So I'm hearing discounted commission. And she said, um, so I think that he's gonna, you know, want the money more and it's gonna be more important to him to close the deal. And I said, yeah, you know, it probably is. I said, it might be important enough to him to throw all of your needs and interests out the window just to close the deal. Have you considered that? What is this guy's track record? And she had no answer to that because she also, I think, probably thinks she knows more than I do about the process. And I have to let her, <laughs> I can't correct that impression, right? right. She's very confident that she could hire someone who's extremely inexperienced and get the same results. I don't feel that way at all because I negotiate across the table from inexperienced agents all year long. However, that's her decision-making. I heard she's looking for someone who will give her a discount and someone who will do, you know, she'll be the boss. Well, I don't mind my clients being the boss, but I like to be, um, I like to be respected for what I bring to the table. And that's the experience and the expertise and really the results. And if there is none of that being valued in the conversation, then it's not a fit. If all they're looking for is a discount broker because they think that they'll get the same results regardless, there's no way to really disabuse them of that notion. And I'm not gonna cut my commission. And even if I did cut my commission, I'm not going to get that job. I knew in the first response when I made a phone call and she said, I told you to email me. This is not someone who wants to work with me. Right. Yeah. 
And so I don't have to spend a lot of time on it. I don't have to go well, through the party. <laughs> and, you know, a whole, a, whole, a whole bunch of things occur to me while you're talking this through is, first of all, <clears throat> nobody's going to get a repeat business unless they're a complete lackey lap, lap, lap dog working for nothing. Yeah. So even if you win the deal, you know, what we're, what we're finding on our end, um, you know, my director of business development, we call them elves and half, the, you know, the easy, lucrative and fun versus a hard, annoying, lame and frustrating. Right. And she says the halves, are, there's not, there's never any repeat business, even if you do business with them and yep. the elves are all repeat business. So you, even if you win the deal with somebody like that, uh, you're going to be working for less. It's going to be painful. It's going to be miserable. And, you know, what's your downstream reward for having done all that? Not, she's not going with you next time ever again. And, and what's the interesting about that, Chris, is the reason why people work with halves is the idea that they are going to get referral business. So they compromise now with the idea that it'll be a future stream of business. And there's a bigger problem because they're taking you away from someone who'll pay you your full fee and be fun to work with. That's the <laughs> bigger problem. I only have so many hours in the day. I have to allocate them sort of in a way that's meaningful to me and satisfying to me. And if I'm working with people who are halves all the time, like that's not a good existence for me either. I'm taking away from my ability, my capacity to work with people who are elves. Right. I don't want to do that. I'd rather not do the, I'd rather not do the business. Cause you got only so many hours in a day. Yeah. I'd rather take the day off. Yeah. And then, and the other thing, which you pointed out that, that I hadn't really realized before, which is true. If an agent is willing to sacrifice all their needs to get, to get to close, then obviously they're willing to throw out all the client's needs as well to get to close. Of course they are. So they're not going to protect it. If they can't, if they won't protect themselves, they will not protect the client. And they can't, they're not getting paid enough to protect the client. They have to get that deal closed and get on to the next one. <laughs> this is fascinating. How, what a bad idea it is to discount your value. I mean, that's I, a downward spiral. Yeah. And you were going to say, I'm Go ahead. No, I keep interrupting you. I'm sorry. I don't want to resent my clients. That's not a good place to be. I do not want to resent my clients. And if I take, you know, a super discount, I might discount it for a reason, right? There's sometimes a reason to discount the fee. I listed like seven units with a guy last or two years ago. I discounted the fee. You know, occasionally there's a, um, I can be, there's a reason, but increasingly less likely. But if I take something that, if I get beat up by the seller, I don't like them. It's really right. challenging, you know, mentally uh -huh. to really walk the line and do absolutely the extra mile for someone who I resent. It's not good for them either. Right. You know, I've changed my whole mindset around how I pay people after I started this process. Really? Yep. So I hired a guy. So I got all new window coverings in my place, 10 grand. The last place I was in, the same guy did all my window coverings and I hammered him on the price. Right. And he, he did a really good job. And this time, so that was like five or six years ago. And so this time I'm going to hire the same guy, all new window coverings. Could I have saved a thousand dollars on this job? Of course. Yeah. Is it worth hammering this guy for that? No, I want what I want. And then I had a little change and he's going to take care of that. And he does it on my schedule. He's happy. I'm happy. The product is going to be better. The scheduling is going to be better. The accommodations are going to be better if I pay the guy his fee. I can't expect to get my fee if I'm not willing to pay other people theirs. Now, yeah. I don't think when I went and bought my Range Rover that I didn't negotiate on that. I did. But if I have someone, you know, perform personal, you know, services, I have a contractor and he's expensive and I pay him his fee because I get what I want. And then he feels good about it. And I feel good about it. When I'm grinding people, they're going to resent me and it's going to show up in the work. And so I started making sure 
that I'm paying the people who provide service to me full fee. My hairdresser always wants to give me a discount. And for years, I've just been uh, over tipping her wildly to make up for the discount because I don't want her to suffer financially because I'm a friend. Right. So recently, because I've been thinking about this more, I asked her, so what is your going rate now for my hair? And she told me, I'm like, oh, I owe you some money then. When did you up your price? And she told me, I'm like, well, I owe you some money for some back haircuts. And she goes, oh, you can donate it to the children's hospital. So I did. And now next time when I go see her, which is Tuesday, I'm going to pay her her full fee and an exorbitant tip because I appreciate and value her work. And those are the clients I want, right? I want yeah. and valued, trusted, listened to, because they're going to get the best from me when that happens. And the best is way more than other agents are going to deliver. It's more money. It's better service. It's better advice. All right. So let, let me go out on a limb here. Uh, it, it sounds like, it actually sounds like you're happier these days. Oh yeah, absolutely. And even though the market's been a little bit slow this year, I'm not worried about it. And that doesn't make me compromise my standards because I don't feel good about myself if I compromise my standards. Right. And how about the, are you, how, how about your team? Is your team happier? So there, well, I have two agents. They're a little nervous because it's been slow for them as well. But uh -huh. every time I tell them, you know, they're, they're learning this as well. You know, they get uh, the buyers that are like, can you kick back commission? And now they're, they're, they're moving into the indignance, which I love. That's how you start standing up for yourself. The first phase is like indignance. How dare they? Yeah. I'm going to work my ass off for these people. Get out of my pocket. <laughs> Let me earn my fee. Yeah. And so they've started to say, yeah, they're starting to notice when that happens that these aren't the kind of clients they want to work with. You know, these are the, cl the clients who grind yeah. us on our commission, take away all the goodwill in the transaction. And they do it to us and they do it to the other side. And invariably, they're going to want some, they're going to want to trade on goodwill and there's not going to be any left. And right. so they put themselves in the foot as well. Right. But yeah, I'm happier. I feel that my, my agents are, are standing up for themselves and they're really noticing when, you know, people are really coming at them from a, you know, give me back some money kind of approach, which is just, it's unpalatable. I mean, it, it goes from indignant to unpalatable to just unacceptable. And then we're like, no, we don't do that. And then you just let the chips fall because you have to trust that you just made space for somebody else. Yeah. Well, you, you know, it's gotta be, for me, it's satisfying when I build my team. It's gotta be satisfying for you to, to see the people that are working for you growing. Absolutely. Absolutely. We just had it with one of the guys on my team and then the client's a, you know, he's a grinder and um, he wanted X and, and Austin, he asked Austin for it, you know, 10 times and 10 times, 11 times, Austin said, no, we don't do that. You know, and this is in the transaction, but then he negotiated well on his behalf. So Yeah, this is cool. Yeah. I Steve, never what, if I have to if I have to pay for the pleasure of the business. Right? I don't <laughs> think about that. Right, right. Wow. Wow. Look, I that that was awesome. I mean, that was absolutely awesome. Steve, was there anything that she's told you in the past that is worth bringing up again? Uh, she just she just nailed it. I think what's fascinating is you've been, you, you got introduced this concept when Regina? I don't know, a year ago, year and a half. And year and a half, I guess. Yeah. And Regina's a top, top, top agent. And like with many top agents, th this is nothing that they ever thought about. The idea that there's a favorite and a fool, they're always the favorite, period. And you know, so anytime they get a phone call, you know, prior to this concept being introduced, they just assume they're the favorite. They're going to go out. They're going to give their, you know, full dog and pony show. Mm -hmm. And then when they don't get the listing, they're like, they're going crazy.
because it, like Regina says, it often goes to someone who's not qualified and they're left sitting there going, what happened? What happened? It makes no sense. Now they know, well, I wasn't the favorite. That's why I didn't get that listing. More importantly, I don't, I, I don't need to be due diligence anymore. And that's what happens with a top agent. A lot of times they're getting phone calls because they are a top agent and the potential seller just wants to do due diligence. And agents didn't realize that's what they were going on appointments for, to provide due diligence. And now as Regina explained, they don't have to make that mistake. They don't have to waste that time. And the, the beauty of it, Chris, is that it just works. So when it, when it, when I am the favorite, it's so effortless. They're short phone calls. We're in alignment. There's a, a likability. There's a connection. It's my people, right? They're right. easy. <laughs> They're easy. And I know a lot of people have brought this up in the past. I mean, people are scared about the gray area. What, what if there's a, they think the gray area is like monstrous and all I got to do is go and perform. It's tiny, huh? I would say it's tiny because there are probably some listings that I could have gotten if I dropped my fee, even a little bit. And those are the gray area ones. Right, right, right. You know? but, but honestly, I couldn't tell you one of those right now. When I've asked, when I've had a good conversation with a potential seller and they didn't hire me, and I felt like this was someone that I could call and get the sort of rundown of like the redux, what happened? I've, I always ask how much of the decision was my fee? Some will say none and some will say really not that much. And I believe them because always invariably something else comes up that was the sticking point for them. I had one woman who didn't, who wonderful, everything was great, but she didn't hire me because I told her that I wasn't available after 6 p.m. And she said, I'm afraid I need somebody who will pick up at night. That's what I'm going to need to talk. Okay. I'm not your agent. Yeah. And, and then how much of that time is, you, is going to get soaked up? I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes. And I can't not have a life, you know, to take care of, uh, of because this was every, if every client would call me at all hours, if I allow them, you know? Right. And I'll tell you the other thing that's come out of this, favorite and the full thing is the 6 p.m. cutoff, which I don't 100% obey, but it allows me to be judicious with who I talk to after 6 p.m. If I, if I talk to a client, it's 612. They'll be like, it's 612. Why are you calling me? <laughs> Those are my, you know, I'm their favorite. So they really respect that cutoff time. And I had a client who actually responded to something on a Saturday. It was fairly urgent. And I don't know, I just responded to something. And the next Friday, I always call my clients Friday afternoon to remind them that I'm off on Saturday and just sort of recap the week. So I was making those phone calls and he said, but are you going to take this Saturday off? Cause you didn't take last Saturday off. Now that is an amazing thing that happens as a result of this. All right, so I'm going to go 90 degrees. I want to go down a rabbit hole, something that you yeah. just mentioned, though. That's really interesting to me. You said you always call your clients to recap the week. Yeah, on Fridays. So they know they're always going to hear from you on Friday. How long have yeah. you been doing that? I know. So it wasn't a plan. It was organic when I started um, more regularly taking my Saturdays off. So at least two years now, but it sort of happened organically. It wasn't a decision. It was the preparation for my off day. So I heard somewhere like, if you're gonna take a day off, you have to prepare the day before. And so I started making these phone calls on Fridays with my active clients to remind them that I'm off on Saturday so they don't call me and potentially be impatient, upset, or worried that I'm not working. And then it morphed into just a higher level of customer service. So every Friday I call all my active clients and I tell wow. them what's happening, then I remind them that I'm taking tomorrow off. They can call me Sunday if they need me, which they never do, they call me Monday. And then they get mad if I call them when I'm supposed to be off, <laughs> 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 which is great. I mean, you know, this is 
unheard of in real estate, Chris, Regina on her voicemail. If you're calling after 6 p.m. or you're calling on a Saturday, all calls will be returned the following business day. And then on Friday, night, on Friday night, I change my email to a bounce back and my, I, I have an automated text response that bounces back as well until Sunday at 11. So are, uh, it um, bounced back. That means the email or text doesn't come through or they get an automatic reply. An automatic reply. It does come through. Okay. All right. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if you, you've ever, if we've ever talked about predictability, taking uncertainty out of it by making the next call from you predictable is a way of building, building trust because you take away the word trust and you put in predictability, then you build trust. That is something I've, I've, I don't know that we've really talked that much, Steve, with you about, you know, that was how we built rapport and calm kidnap victim families down. And then I found out that there was an agent in Australia, about, probably about five years ago, that that's exactly what she was doing. And her referral rate was far in excess of anybody else's. And she said, you know, we have scheduled calls with clients and they know when we're, we're nobody ever wonders when they're going to hear from us and because of that they trust us so that's you yeah. tumbling to that is brilliant i mean it's absolutely brilliant it's probably going farther than you realize but as you just described a higher level of customer service yeah and it started out to really just put the the boundaries around my day off and it turned into like the weekly wrap-up you know, and it, it's, uh, yeah, I know my clients appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, and it has to have a massive impact on, on your referral pipeline. Yeah. You feel like you're looking out for them. Yeah. Yep. The thing I'd like Regina to talk about, this concept that she came up with called putting guardrails around her business. And maybe Regina, you could speak to that. And what are the certain guardrails you've put in place? Yeah, so it's interesting because Steve has me lead his call on some Wednesdays, and I think that's where I first used that phrase. Can, yes, hold on for just a second. Um, so guardrails. So, you know, one of the things that I, I, I'm extremely consistent in my business. You know, I'm consistent in what I do every day. I tend to obey my calendar more times than not. Uh, I tend to do routine, 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 routine. Um, but this is a 24 seven business if we let it, you know, it's a 24 seven mm -hmm. business if we let it. The clients will call us, the agent, it's really, the only people who really violate my hours are the other agents. They're the ones that get mad. <laughs> like what <laughs> are <during these> hours? <laughs> so the guardrails protect me, their boundaries. They keep me from going off the rails, right? They keep me from, running around like a crazy person, trying to chase down everything that doesn't need to be done right now. Not everything is urgent. I don't need to, uh, and I don't need to do all of it. Like I have people to help with all of this stuff, assistants, buyers, agents, marketing people. I have support to do all of this stuff. So my, like my guardrails are like my work hours. That's the first one, right? Those are my work hours. I have other guardrails where I turn my cell phone off at night. It's not on silent. It's off, completely off at night. And I'd like to get it 12 hours. I'm only down to like 10 right now. I got to get it back to 12 hours because that is a nice break. Like 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Have that phone off. I'm a super early riser. So like I woke up at about four today. Maybe I got up around 4.15. I don't look at the phone till much later in the, in the morning. It's not the first thing that I do. I don't want to look at my phone. <laughs> first thing in the morning. Like those are my guardrails, you know? I work out every day. I have to work out because I'm a, um, I'm a frenetic, high energy, high stress, high anxiety sort of baseline and working out really tempers all of that stuff. And so that's something that I make time for every day. And those things, right? Those are the things that keep me even. I'm not an even killed person, but it keeps me like employable, you know? <laughs> it keeps yeah. me normal enough, 
you know, and those are the things that like, if I violate those things, it goes back to that sort of doormatting feeling. I don't want to talk to people at nine o'clock at night, at 10 o'clock at night. You know, when someone texts me at 10 o'clock at night, one in the days when my phone used to be on first thing in the morning, I would text them back at 430. Like, sorry, hope your phone's off. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so the guardrails are the things that keep me like even keeled. And I think most of them, Steve, are like around my schedule. You know, it's like every day it's the same thing. I get up at like four, four thirty. I sit around for an hour and drink coffee. I have quiet time, maybe a little meditation. I read these little meditation books. I chill with the dog. It's quiet. You know, there's no one around. The phone isn't ringing. No one's bugging me. That's a guardrail for me. That's protected space for me. And then um, I do my workout and then I get on the eight o'clock call. Then I have an 8.30 meeting uh, with my team. And then nine o'clock is breakfast. Around 9.30, I get on the phone. Every single day is like that. Unless I have an exception I will deal with and next day will be like that. And then at night, it's the same thing. I have my same wind down thing. My phone goes off at six. I have my certain routine at night. I want to get all of these things sort of done because it's a nice bookend to my day. And then I try to really go to bed early every night. You know, I heard, um, oh God, what's his name? The chef, Jeffrey Sod. Uh, Jeffrey he said, um, he said, there's two types of six. There's two types of successful people. Those that wake up naturally at five and those that have to set an alarm. And I'm like, that's a guardrail for me. Like I go to bed early and I get up early. You know, I'm not, I don't stay out. I don't, first off, I have no social life and that's by design. I don't mind that. I like a quiet life when I'm not in real estate. Um, but I want to make sure that I'm just taking care of all of that other stuff around me, you know, so that I can like function in a very high stress environment. And I'm functioning in an environment where, you know, our clients are extremely needy. You know, right. there's people are selling and buying real estate because someone died because they got divorced. You know, that's not always fun. And sometimes it's a job change or they got married or they had a baby and it is fun, but it's always high stress. And they have a lot of needs for our time and attention. And I have to be able to perform to that and have the energy available. You know, sometimes I talk about my clients as a box of newling kittens, all need. And if right, I'm not right, right. Taking care of myself, I can't take care of them. Well, and it was something I was, uh, I heard recently, it talked about um, the more that you can basically wall yourself off from people, the more you can be compassionate. You need a break, you need to recharge. Yeah. And if you really want to be there for people, you have to carve out time where you're not there for them. And you're doing exactly that. You're giving them more compassion and more service by putting those guardrails up. When I'm fried and overwhelmed, I'm queen bee. And it's not pleasant, you know, it's not pleasant. <laughs> right. And my job is to, you know, try to minimize the, the emergence of my alter ego, you know, and I, I have to <laughs> enough sleep you know getting enough sleep like having time off um and and that thing like being away from people it's 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 it, it hits home because my mornings i don't i am very it's solitude i enjoy my solitude it's very restorative right. and then the other things that are guardrails that aren't so much about like my physical and mental health or just about like my work schedule you know i don't um I like to tell people the truth. I like to give them, um, I like to prepare them for the truth. I don't like skirt around difficult conversations. Um, that's a guardrail. I can't leave things unsaid that need to be said to the client because it's an uncomfortable conversation. Recently, I've been getting a lot of, um, I mean, being hired by people whose listings have expired with another agent. Okay, now these aren't things that I seek out. Um, there are agents who, you know, seek out, expire, go after expired listings. I, it's not been my practice, but I get a lot of those inbound calls. And what I'm learning about why the listings expire is because the agent has not had the tough conversation with the seller, at least half the time. Sometimes it's the seller. Sometimes the seller won't hear it. But what I'm hearing is a lot of the times the stuff that needs 
needs to be said isn't even being brought up. And so I don't like to leave those things undone. And using like, again, what I'm learning with, with you, Chris, and with Steve is, you know, preparing people for bad news. You know, right. allowing them to be in the right headspace to hear something that they, you know, may not want to hear. Right, that, right, that right. Too. So it's all of those things. It's really like, what, what should I be doing? And then, you know, do it. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh the favorite and the fool, that is a guardrail. You know, that protects you from doing stuff you don't need to do. Yeah, it's it protects me from chasing. Chasing is burnout mode, right? If I don't wanna be overwhelmed, crazy queen bee, I can't chase. If I'm chasing, it will immediately put me in that spot because it's a very frustrating spot to be in. You're always trying to find out, what do I need to say? What do I need to do to get this business? It's like, I don't want to be in that position. Knowing whether I'm the favorite or the fool allows me to take a step back from all of that and not wonder, you know, what should I not pour over in my head over and over again? What should I have said? What did I do wrong? I don't have to do any of that stuff. Like it frees up a lot of mental space when I understand whether I'm the favorite or the fool. Yeah, it's a fear-driven life otherwise. Mm-hmm. Constantly be in fear. Wow. What a miserable, what a miserable place to be. Yeah. I'm good. This was awesome. This was Re- Regina, you are generous. You are wonderful. Thank you. I'm gonna call you at 10 o'clock tonight. My phone will be off. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll call me back at four. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Miss Call. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, returning your call. Now you're you're delightful. You're wonderful. Thank you for being so generous with your thoughts. Yeah, really appreciate everything you're teaching us, Chris. It's it's uh it totally has changed the way I do things, and it's it does make my life a lot better and easier. I have more good even fun. I have more free time. Amen. Cool. Amen. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Cool. Cool. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Chris. Talk to you guys soon. All right. Bye-bye.